and it belongs to us. It belongs to our church. And why am I so passionate about the great controversy? It's because when I get to heaven, there's one man by the name of Jim Harper from Manjimup in Western Australia who placed that book in my hand. And that's why Marianne and I have been living a wonderful lifestyle uh, following and serving our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, we want, to, we want other people to also experience this lifestyle and, uh, and to have and share in the plan of salvation. So uh, please um, put your prayers behind this project. Amen. It's great to see that at Queen's birthday weekend we have visitors. And it's great that uh, Belsie and Gareth are with us again today. Holly's uh, been released from college for a couple of minutes. That's great too to have you here. But as, we, as the world celebrates the Queen's birthday, we celebrate the King's birthday every Sabbath that he came and died for us. And uh, that, that is a privilege to be in his house this morning. I was out with the teens a couple of weeks ago and, uh, and I was really blessed by just being out there with them even though they were in a bit of a Sabbath morning coma, you could take it. Uh, but the message was fantastic because uh, it was about taken from the book of Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 26, and I'd just like you to turn to that. Second Chronicles chapter 26. You know, and it's, uh, it's not a, a favourite part of, of Scripture for me, but I, I really enjoyed it uh, this time round. And I'd like us just to read um, down through these pages because it tells a wonderful story, a sad story, but wonderful in the sense that it also can relate, uh, that we can relate to it. So reading from the book of Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 26, reading from verse 1. It says, Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the room of his father, Amaziah. He built Eloth and restored it to Judah. After that, the king slept with his father. Eloth is a, is a little seaside village, and uh, under his reign, he rebuilt that, and that is where the king slept, his father. 16 years old was Uzziah when he... Uzziah when he began to reign, and he reigned at fifty and two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was uh, Jehoiada of Jerusalem, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah did. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understood in the vision, who had understanding, sorry, in the visions of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And he went forth and warred against the Philistines and break down the wall of Gath, the wall of Jabneth, Jabneh, and the wall of Ashdod, and built cities about Ashdod and among the Philistines. And God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians that dwelt in Kubal and uh, sorry, Mehunims, and the Amorites gave gifts to Uzziah and his name spread abroad, abroad, even to the entering in of Egypt, for he strengthened himself exceedingly. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and at the valley gate and at the turning of the wall and fortified them. Also he built towers in the deserts and digged many wells, for he had much cattle, both in the low country and in the plains, husbandmen also in vine dresses in the mountains, and in Carmel, for he loved husbandry. Moreover, Uzziah had a host of fighting men that went out to war by bands according to the number of their account by the hand of Jeel, the scribe, and Messiah, the ruler under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains. The whole number of the fathers of the mighty men of valor were 2,600. And under their hand was an army, 300,000, 7,500, that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. And Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the host, shields, spears, helmets, hubbagons, bows, and slings to cast stones. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones with all. And his name spread, uh, sorry, and his name spread 
were for abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. And we'd just like to stop there, and we'd just like to reflect on what we've read. The long king, the long reign of King Uzziah, who's also known as Azariah in the book of Kings, in the land of Judah and Benjamin, was characterized by a prosperity greater than in, of any other ruler since the death of Solomon nearly two centuries before. Isn't that amazing? Two centuries before King Solomon had ruled and now uh, King Uzziah had, uh, was ruling in Judah and Benjamin. Under the blessing of heaven, his armies regained some of the territory that had been lost in former years. Cities were rebuilt and fortified and the position of the nation among the surrounding pre uh, people was greatly strengthened. Commerce revived and the riches of the nations flowed into Jerusalem. Uzziah's name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. I just want you to kind of make a mental note of that word, till he was strong. His outward prosperity, however, was not accompanied by a corresponding revival of spiritual power. And how often have we seen this through the history of Israel and Judah? Even his, uh, his father, as mentioned as a, uh, in um, 25, chapter 2, and it says, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. So even his son was duplicating or replicating his father. The temple services were, were continued as in former years, and multitudes assembled to worship the living God. But pride and formality gradually took the place of humility and sincerity. We go back to, to, our, to, our, to the scripture, and it says, um, in from, reading from verse um, 14, is it 15? Oh no, 16, sorry. About this fact that when he was strong, said his heart was lifted up to destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God. The sin that resulted so disastrously to Uzziah was one of presumption. I'd just like to read that now uh, from verse 16 down. And it says, But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest went after him and with him fourscore priests of the Lord that were valiant men and they withstood Uzziah the king and said unto him it, app it appertaineth not unto thee Uzziah to burn incense unto the Lord but to the priests the sons of Aaron that are consecrated to burn incense go out of the sanctuary for thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be for thy honour from the Lord God. And Uzziah was wroth, and had a censer in his hand to burn incense, and while he was wroth with the priest, suddenly the leprosy even rose upon his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord from, be from beside the incense altar. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they thrust him out from thence, yes, himself hasted also to go out because the Lord had smitten him. In 21, and Uzziah the king was a leper unto the day of his death and dwelt in a, sev in a several house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham his son was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Isn't that so sad? Here we have a king that was prosperous as long as he was connected to God. But as soon as he felt strong and capable, he went in to the sanctuary of the Lord, this sanctuary that Solomon had built so many years before, the temple, and wanted to, and thought himself able to offer incense unto the Lord. But praise God that the priest knew their duties and were able to convince him to leave. But it was too late. God had smitten him with leprosy, and as we know in the Bible, leprosy represents uh, the condition of sin. And of course, he was never able to carry out his duties as king ever again. 
And I thought, wow, how often do we fall into a similar trap like King Uzziah did? You know, God has blessed us with all wonderful things, uh, with homes, with food, with clothing, with cars, and we think, yeah, we're, we're happy in our church, everything's comfortable, and then suddenly we transgress in a manner or, or, or other. So we'd just like to, to go a bit deeper into this today. It talks about that, and I'll repeat that, that the sin result that resulted so disastrously to Uzziah was one of presumption. And it's interesting to note what our uh, sister White writes in regards in the desire agent ages and to this word presumption or the sin of presumption. We know the word presume means to take for granted, suppose to be a fact. Presumption to take too much upon oneself. But she goes on to say, but faith is in no sense allied to presumption. Only he who has true faith is secure against temptation. Oh, sorry, against presumption. For presumption is Satan's counterfeit of faith. Isn't that powerful? I say it again. For presumption is Satan's counterfeit of faith. Faith claims God's promises and brings forth fruit in obedience. Presumption also claims the promises but uses them as Satan did to excuse transgression. Faith would have led our first parents to trust the love of God and to obey his commands. Presumption led them to transgress his law, believing that his great love would save them from the consequences of their sin. It is not faith that claims the favour of heaven without complying with the conditions of which mercy is to be granted. Genuine faith has its foundation in the promises and provisions of the scriptures. In violation of a plain command of Jehovah, our Lord God, that none but the descendants of Aaron should officiate as priests, the king entered the sanctuary to burn uh, incense upon the altar. But just let's look at this word presumption. His great love would say, sorry, presumption led them to transgress his law, believing that his great love would save them from the consequences of their sin. How often do we fall into this trap, thinking it's okay to do what I'm doing? God loves me nevertheless. But that's presumption. Faith is the condition by which we are to walk uh, in, in, in regards to God's scripture and in his favour. Let's just look at uh, some of the, these key texts here um, in Second Chronicles chapter 26. And it says in verse 4, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah did. Amaziah was also a high priest, and uh, we find that recorded in First Chronicles 6.10, where it says, uh, And Johanan begat Azariah, and he is, he is that executed the priest's uh, office in the temple of Solomon, built in Jerusalem. In verse 5 it goes on, And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. You know, and that is such a true saying for us today. When we search, search the Lord, seek him every day anew, he is with us constantly, ready to bless us in a way that we have no understanding. And he does. But as soon as we turn our back on him thinking that it's okay, it's not okay. Presumption is not okay in the Christian walk. But it's interesting to note that as soon as that uh, Uzziah was told by the priest, he was suddenly filled with wrath and anger. He is the king, he can do this. But he was not permitted to purvein the sanctuary against the united protest of those in authority. While standing there in wrathful rebellion, he was suddenly smitten with a divine judgment. Amazing. Amazing. It wasn't just because he was king didn't allow him to enter the sanctuary and carry out 
uh, a tradition of the Levites that had been going on for years and that was ordained by God. The soul that falls presumptuously, whether he is born in the land or a stranger, the same reproaches the Lord, and that shall be cut off from among his people. The judgment that befell Uzziah seemed to have a restraining influence on his son. Jotham bore heavy responsibilities during the later years of his father and succeeded to the throne after Uzziah's death. It's amazing, this, this particular point, that when he was strong, he then sinned. You know, we sometimes think in our lives when we get to a certain position in our walk with the Lord that we are strong too and that we can do what we want. We can't. We've got to walk in the commandments of God. Even the Ammonites gave gifts to Uzziah and his name spread even to the entry of Egypt. And it says he strengthened himself exceedingly. His kingdom was strong and it was simply because God had blessed him because he was in connection with God. But then when he thought he was able to enter the sanctuary and pollute it uh, with, his sac with his offering, then he was smitten with judgment. Often when Satan has failed of exciting distrust, he succeeds in leading us to, into presumption. If he can cause us to place ourselves, ourselves unnecessarily in the way of temptation, he knows that the victory is his. God will preserve all who walk in the path of obedience, but to part from it is to venture on Satan's ground. There we are sure to fall. The Saviour has bidden us, watch ye and pray, lest you enter into temptation, as we find in Mark uh, chapter 18, verse 38. Isn't that a powerful text? And it, so often we forget it. It says, watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. That's not talking about somebody else or another church member. That's talking about us, you and me. Let us pray and watch, lest we enter into temptation. It can happen just like that. Meditation and prayer would keep us from rushing willingly into the way of danger and thus we should be saved from many a defeat. Isn't that powerful? Yet we should not lose courage when assailed by temptation. Often when placed in a trying situation, we doubt that the Spirit of God has been leading us, but it was the Spirit's leading that brought us to Jesus, that brought, sorry, Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. When God brings us into trial, he has a purpose to accomplish for our good. Jesus did not presume on God's promises by going willingly into temptation. Neither did he give up despondency when temptation came upon him. Nor should we. God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape? that you may be able to bear it. He says, Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay the vows unto the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. We find that in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 or in Psalms 50, verse 14 and 15. Even when we are tempted, there is a way out. He's got a door open. But by ourselves, we can't do it. Temptation causes us to fall. And I thought, you know, that's a, that's a very interesting um, transcript of the life of King Uzziah. But, you know, I also find another interesting one. Just because he was king doesn't mean he was protected. And just because we are who we are, we were not protected from... Uh, sorry, we are protected, I mean, through God if we're connected with him. But Satan is trying to um, bring us down every day anew. And just turning to the book of Exodus, if we just back up a few, um, few books, to Exodus chapter 17, and we all know uh, these verses. And uh, it's talking about, about Moses, of course, um, in his uh, wilderness walk with the Lord. Exodus chapter um, 17, reading from verses 6 to 10. And this is the Lord, you know, here we have, again, the Israelites complaining that they've been brought out into the desert to die, but the, and they're asking Moses and the Lord for water. And uh, it says, 
Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And then it goes on to say that he made it a special name for the particular place. So here we have a different story, though, when we go over to Numbers 20, 18, uh, reading from verses 8 to 20. So just keep your finger in that page, and let's just go over to Numbers. Numbers, sorry, uh, chapter 20, reading from verses 18, 8 to 20. And it's the same situation. They're in a different part of the desert now, and again, they're complaining uh, to God and to Moses that they're going to uh, die of thirst. And, uh, and Moses and Aaron, uh, sorry, reading from verse 8. And the Lord uh, spoke unto Moses, saying, Again, take thy rod and gather thy the assembly together, thou and Aaron, thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth this water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so that thou should give the congregation and their beasts drink. And it says, And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregations together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, you rebels, must we fetch water you uh, sorry, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beast also. And the Lord spoke unto Moses Aaron, saying, uh, Because you believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Wow, isn't that an amazing story? Two very similar, similar examples, but two different commands from the Lord and one very different reaction from Moses. Moses was a man after God's own heart. You know, he loved the Lord. He served him wonderfully. But in this particular case, particular situation, he changed and he took the glory away from God onto himself. In the first instance, God, Jesus says to him, I will stand above or before the up before the rock and he told him to, to strike it okay and Moses did so and it happened as as the Lord requested him to do but in the second instance he told them exactly the same as in the first to take the rod and he did um, in verse verse 9 and Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded as he commanded him but what did the Lord tell him to do speak to it but for some reason I don't know what it was. Moses took upon himself to smite the rock. But if, before that, he then takes the, uh, the job upon himself, I should say, where he says to the congregation, um, uh, he refers to them, Here now, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of, his rock, out of this rock? So you see what the difference is? He didn't let God or have their faith in God. He didn't sanctify the Lord by, by uh, uh, doing what the Lord had asked them. The Lord said, I want you to show the people through their eyes that they can see how holy I am so that they can sanctify me. But he didn't. He said, must we fetch water out of that rock for you? You know, looking at it from a human standpoint, that's impossible because it was God who did it, right? And even though Moses glorified himself at that moment, God still allowed water to come out of, out of the rock. However, there was a consequence, wasn't there? Moses was not allowed to enter the physical promised land. However, due to his repentance, we know that God was willing to forgive him. Amazing story. So if that happens to Moses, who was a much more, we think, a closer man to God than we are, I hope not. I hope we are closer than Moses because as John mentioned this morning in, in the Sabbath school, we've been raised up in the earth's history for a very important job and that's to be his witnesses. Romans 6.23 goes on to say, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin is the transgression. 
And you know, the world talks about, and I, had, I was at a meeting this week, where they talked about the seven deadly sins. And of course, someone say, yeah, that comes out of the Catholic Church. Yeah, they talk about that a lot. And they do. And of course, growing up in the Catholic Church, I was exposed to this. But you know, when you think of the seven deadly sins, where are they found? In the realm of the Ten Commandments. And I'd just like to just touch on them, because one of the first ones is pride. And how many Christians today suffer from, from pride? Pride, it goes on to say, is excessive belief in one's own abilities. That interferes with individuals' recognition of the grace of God. It has been called the sin from which all others arrive. Pride is also known as vanity. We are upholding, uh, sorry, we are upholding our image instead of God's image. And it's so true, isn't it? Out of pride comes a lot of other sins. The second one they mention is envy. Envy is the desire of others' traits, status, abilities, or situation. Jealousy is a sin before the Lord, of God, before the Lord our God. The third one is gluttony. is an inordinate desire to consume more than that which one, one requires. And that comes under also selfishness. Which we've, when we're selfish, we're not loving others as we should. But when you think of gluttony too, it also comes into the realm of addiction. People overdosing, uh, not only in, in food, but in, in substances also. And of course, the one that is really dangerous today is the one of lust. Lust is an inordinate craving for the pleasures of the body. And when you think about it, when you look at churches worldwide, this is one of the sins that is pulling a lot of churches down. A lot of fantastic men and women have, uh, have lost um, their walk with the Lord through this sin of lust. And it's amazing where it starts. It can start spiritually simply by uh, contemplating pornography. And where do we find the excess so readily today is on the internet. What we lust after, where they've already sinned, is if we've committed the crime. And it's happening today, unfortunately, where adultery um, is happening among the saints. Anger is manifested in an individual who spurns love and opts instead for fury. It is also known as wrath. And, you know, when we're angry against somebody, we, it goes on to, the, to uh, develop the word hate which is, again, against the law of God. We're supposed to love people. Greed is the desire for material wealth or gain, ignoring the realm of the spirituality. is also called covetousness. And uh, that comes under the ninth commandment, doesn't it? We shall not covet. But greed is also a waste of what God has given to us as his stewards. You know, everything he's blessed us with belongs to him. And sometimes we think... We can rob God by giving his money to other, uh, other institutions who preach a different gospel. He's blessed us to help us preach his gospel, not the gospels as in interpreted by other men. And of course, sloth is the avoidance of physical or spiritual work, laziness. We have to be um, awake and uh, in good health to, uh, to work for the Lord. And in just summarizing today what we've been through, I'd like just to turn to the first book of John, chapter 3. First book of John, chapter 3, uh, at the end of the Old Testament for those uh, new people with us today. I'd just like to read this also from the NIV version. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God. Isn't that a, a wonderful privilege to be called sons of God? Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. It didn't know Jesus, but today they have a wonderful opportunity to know Jesus through us. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it did not yet appear that we shall be, but we know when he shall appear. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And you know, 
we are today striving to recreate in ourselves that image, that original image of God. And every man that hath this hope in him purify himself even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. For we know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither knoweth him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil, wheresoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. What a wonderful position to be in, to be so connected to God that, uh, that we wouldn't be able to sin. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doth not righteousness, is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that you should love one another. And also like the other text too that's referred to in the book of Hebrews, it says, how shall we escape such great a salvation if we neglect what we have? You know, and that's a powerful verse, isn't it? Eh? How shall we neglect so great a salvation? And it's a wonderful gift. So why would you want to give this gift away? You know, we've been given the tools to help us to stay close to God, to uh, prepare ourselves for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the wonderful tool is his word uh, that he gave, gave us so long ago. And I just want to re-emphasize that fact, spend time in the study of God's word. The second tool that he's given us is the spirit of prophecy. And what a privilege uh, we are as a church to have these wonderful writings to confirm the scriptures and to uphold um, the truths of the scriptures. So we, as Christians, are in a, in a, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, are in a wonderful place. But not only do we have that, we have a wonderful promise, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And it's great to see so many of you people uh, encouraged to pray every day anew for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And that's why I'm thankful that uh, we already have small groups in our church. Prayer group, the clothing program is mentioned, the food program, and we're just going to build on these groups in order that we can get this message out there. Because the more that we're working for the Lord, the less that we are tempted to be like King Isaiah or to make a mistake like Moses. And that's my prayer for all of you today, in Jesus' name. Amen.